We left Yaakov Avinu with his hands crossed over one another and he started giving the blessing and finally we're finding and seeing Yosef's reaction to his, what should I say, surprise, bewilderment. What in the world is going on over here? Why is Yaakov putting his hand on the wrong son? She put the right hand on the older one, the Bukhar, the firstborn, his left hand on the next son, who was not the firstborn. The main blessing should go to the Bukhar, to the firstborn, because if he's firstborn, nothing happens by itself. Obviously, that was God's will. He should be born first. And the one who was born first gets priority and gets a stronger blessing than the other one. And here, Yaakov puts his right hand on the second born, his left hand on the first born, starts blessing them. And now Yosef reacts. <clears throat> And we say, I quote, we have it on our glossary sheet, the number one. Vayar Yosef. And Yosef saw that his father put his right hand on the head of Ephraim. Vayera Be'enov. It was wrong in his eyes. It was wrong what he saw. And then he did something which seems to be out of place for him to do. Vayismach Yad Oviv. He actually supported his father's hand to remove it from the head of Ephraim to put it in the head of Manasseh. He went ahead physically and took his hand and started taking it off. Well, that seems to be not too uh, honorable to his father to physically go against him and take his hand and remove his hand. That's number one. Then it says, Yosef said to his father, Loi chein avi. Right, number two, he supported the father's hand. And number three, not so, my father. al This is the firstborn. Put your hand on this one, your right hand. Put your right hand on this one. You have it in the wrong one. Maybe he thought the father made a mistake, didn't recognize it was hard for sin. We said he couldn't see good. Yaakov, you know, maybe he thought he saw what he didn't see. Maybe he wanted to give a little bit of a encouragement to Menashe. But now, it comes to the blessing, he has to do the right thing. So a question that bothered me for many years, me personally, what is Yosef saying to his father? Not so, my father. Is that how you talk to a father? But well, he's doing something wrong? It's not. Because, here I'll quote the Rambam, number four, quoted the Rambam and the laws of honoring one's parents. The Rambam wrote an unbelievable book, including all the laws of the Torah, and he includes the laws of Kibbutz of Aim, honoring one's parents. And this is based on the Talmud, what he's writing over here. And it writes as follows, number four. And this quote from the Rambam, the word for word. Ra'ahu over al Torah. If a child sees his parents transgressing and going against one of the laws of the Torah, you should not say, my father, you are going against transgressing the words of the Torah. You don't say, you're going against the Torah. Not so, my father. That's how you address a parent like that? You don't, you don't say that. So what do you do? Number five is Abba. This is still quoting the Rambam. The Torah says so and so. Doesn't the Torah say this and this? You don't tell them, don't do it. The Torah, you say, doesn't it in a nice, 
honorable way, as if you're asking him a question, doesn't the Torah say so and so? So the father understands that he should think what he's doing and stop doing. So here, it seems that Yosef made a double mistake on the surface by grabbing his father's hand, taking his father's hand and removing it. And the way he spoke to him doesn't seem to, seem to be an honorable way of speaking. According to the Rambam, based on the Gemara, we're not supposed to speak to our parents, even when they're doing something wrong, in a strong, rough, sure not, I can't use the rough way, strong, telling them, even to say to them, ask them, doesn't, aren't you supposed to do this? Isn't it supposed to, as if you're asking, as if, as if you're not sure of yourself. And they just get the hint, and they will stop doing what they're doing. So number one, why did he grab the father, take the father's hand? Let's say that a person is sitting with his parents, and for some reason they don't realize to pick up a piece of meat that's not kosher. So they're about to eat it. What do you, what do, you do? Let's say there's no time to say anything. Are you allowed to stop them from eating it? Yes. Because you don't want them to go ahead and eat something that's not kosher. You're allowed to physically stop them from eating it because you don't want them to do the wrong thing. So that wouldn't be a problem over here. The fact that he took his father's hand, he was afraid he's going to finish the blessing. He started blessing him and giving the blessing to the wrong son. He thought he's making a mistake. And that's not proper. If God made him <coughs> born first, that means he wants him to get the main blessing and not to get the secondary blessing. So therefore, that's not a problem that he said to his father. He took his father's hand, tried to remove it because he thought the father's doing something wrong. So that's not so, that's not, so, that's, that's understandable. But the second thing, but how do you speak to him in such a way, a demanding way? Finally, I found in one of the great commentaries who says, because of this question, it's about many years, this question, and the Rashbam, one of the great commentaries on the Torah, tells us we're, we're learning, we're, we're understanding the words that he said in the wrong way. When he said, Lo of vi, he did not mean to say, don't do this, you're doing the wrong thing. What he's saying was, he thought to himself, why is he doing this? Because he probably thinks for some reason I mixed them up, I put them in the wrong way. And he thinks that I put Ephraim on one side, Shemash on the other side, the wrong way. And therefore, he's crossing his hands and said, Lo, it's not so that I did something wrong. He didn't say, you're doing, don't do it to him. He said, Lo, it's, not what you th it's not what you think that I did a main mistake. I did the right thing. You don't have to cross your hands over. That's what he's going on himself. Lo, it's not so that I made a mistake and put them on the wrong side. He was not telling Yaakov, don't do so, my father. Don't do it. To talk to him, he said, I did the right thing. It's not like you think I did. I made a mistake. Because the way you're crossing your hands, you must think that I put them the wrong way. So therefore, you're crossing your hand. You think you're putting your hand on Manasseh, your right hand. But it's not so. I put them the right way. Manasseh is to your left, which is my, your right, which is my left. And Ephraim is my right, which is your left. That's what Lochain Ovi. But he certainly would not talk to his father in the not honorable way. He wouldn't have said that to him. So finally, he found an answer to this question. So we have an answer to both. The fact that he took the father's hand because to stop, to stop somebody from doing something wrong, even to a parent, you're allowed to stop them. Certainly, especially if they, they're happy they're doing it. They're happy they shouldn't make a mistake. They'd be very upset. Why did you let me do it? If they say, I'm doing something wrong, you should stop me right away. And the way he spoke to him is also not a question because he's talking about himself. Lo chain of It's not so that I did the made the mistake. So you don't have to worry about it. You can put your hands in the right way. So now, what was Yaakov Vinu's answer? 
So number six, Lo Sisi Cain. I did not do so. Not that you should not do so. Demanding. I did not do so the way you think that I made the mistake. I didn't make the mistake. So Yaakov answered him, by mind Aviv, his father refused to change his hands. Number seven. I know, my son, I know. Saying it twice. I know. What's saying it twice? I know. I know what I'm doing. I know that you put them the right way. I know you put Nanasha on my right side and Frame on my left side. I'm not making a making mistake. You didn't make a mistake. But your dati, I know something else also. I know what I'm doing. I know everything that's happening. But I also know something that you don't know. And that's why I'm giving the main blessing to Ephraim and the secondary blessing to Manasseh. Because I know something that you don't know. What do I know that you, that you don't know? And he went on to say, That's number nine. He will also become great. It's true. Manasseh, the first way, he'll become great. But his younger brother will be greater than him. He'll be a great person, Manasseh. But his brother, Ephraim, who's younger, will be greater than he is. And he saw a prophecy in the future. What did he see? In Manasseh, he'll be great. Before we said he saw some bad people coming up from each one. Remember, the Shekinah went away from him. A few weeks ago, we discussed that God took away his spirit from Yaakov because of Shoyim, of wicked people coming into future, future generations. Here he saw the opposite of the great people coming out from them. And he said, Yodati, in number 10, Shegidain, Osir Lotzeis Mimenu, Shekadosh Anais Al Yodai. Gidain was a great leader of the Jewish people. If those of you studied the book of Judges, Joshua, and the book of Judges, second of the uh, Prophets, Book of Prophets. Number one book is Joshua. The next book is the Judges. One of the great judges of the Jewish people was the name of Gidon. Gimel, the Adalat, what we have written down over here, Gidon. Gidon was a great leader of the Jewish people, and he led them against the Midian, the Midianites, who were oppressing the Jewish people at that time. We're talking about early history of the Jewish people in the land of Israel. When they came into the land of Israel from Egypt, and the first leader was Yeshua. We'll mention his name right away. And after Yeshua, there were different leaders that came and led the Jewish people. And one of them was Gidon, who fought against the Midianim. Midian was an enemy of the Jewish people, oppressing them very much. And Gidon led the Jewish people against the Midianim. The whole story of how, how he did it with a very clever way of fighting against the middle of the night. He came with all kinds of loud noises, with shafers, and put a shafer and bang, broke all kinds of, 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 of uh, earthenware to make a big noise, and he made all kinds of torches. He just scared them out of their wits, but he, he did very clever that they, they chased away the Midianim, the Midianites from the Jewish people. So Gidon will come out from Manasseh, who was a great leader, and he will help the Jewish people, and God will be with him and make a big miracle for him. That's true. So that shows that he has within him, in his genes, he has Gidon. That will be very great and help the Jewish people. But, his younger brother would be greater than he will be. What will be so great about Ephraim? 
number 12, number 11, Achiv HaKot and Yigdal Mimenu, his younger brother will be greater than him. And number 12, She'asid Yehoshua, Lot says Mimenu, She'anchol Esart, Limit Torah Yisrael. This Ephraim, the younger brother, he will have one of his descendants by the name of Yehoshua, Joshua. Joshua, Yehoshua was the disciple of Moshe Rabbeinu. He was the direct, the greatest student of Moses, was Yahshua. He took over for him. And Moshe Rabbeinu died at the end of 40 years. The Jews were in the desert. They were about to enter, go across the River Jordan into the Holy Land. Moshe Rabbeinu was not allowed to cross over. And Yeshua took the reins of the Jewish people and led them for many years afterwards. And he fought the battles in the land of Israel itself. Moshe Rabbeinu fought the battles in the desert. Sichon, the Og, all the kings that attacked the Jewish people, Moshe Rabbeinu took care of them. But now, crossing into the Holy Land, there were many, many kings that were against the Jewish people, and they were trying to stop them and destroy them. Yeshua is the one who conquered them, and he was the one who divided the land to the Jewish people. And he taught Torah to the Jewish people. The two great things about him so far. So therefore he said he is going to, God will do a miracle for the descendants of Manasseh, but he'll do greater miracles. Let's put it this way. The greater person of the two in the genes of Ephraim is Yeshua. Yeshua will be the one to give the portions of land to the Jewish people, and he will teach Torah to the Jewish people. He'll be the student of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he'll teach Torah, which is, this is the lifeblood of the Jewish people, is the Torah. So he will be greater, and not only that. Number 13, he will be famous amongst the nations of the world. What will his fame be? His fame will be that he will, but we have, he will stop the sun. Stop the sun, what happened was, the Jewish people were fighting against the enemies, being led by Yahshua, and they were conquering their enemy, but they didn't finish the job yet. It was getting late in the day. Once it gets dark, it's hard to find the enemy. So Yahshua gave out a proclamation Shemesh begivain daim. The sun, please give it stop. Stop, stop. Right where you are, we have to finish off this battle when it's still daylight. And God listened to him, stop the, stop the sun. The day stopped where it was until the Jewish people finished off the job of getting rid of their enemies. And then the sun went further on. Similar to Yaakov Avinu, we find that Yaakov Avinu had the sun go down faster for him, come up, come up faster for him. Yeshua, he did this great miracle. The whole world was startled by it. The whole world found out about it. Imagine that, the sun stopping in the middle of the day. Imagine tomorrow, we'll be in the middle at noontime, and we'll look at the clock, and it says at one o'clock, and the sun's still overhead. Two o'clock, the sun's still there. Everybody would go out of their minds, what's happening? The world's coming to an end. It's coming to a beginning. What's happening over here? So the whole world was startled and was recognizing the greatness of Yeshua, that he, they traced it back to Yeshua, that he's the one who stopped the sun from going down. So therefore, Yaakov said to Yosef, Asher will be very great, but Ephraim, he's going to have all this, this great Yeshua coming out. That he's going to be so close to Hashem. He's teaching Torah to the Jewish people. He'll divide the land to them, and he'll be so great. He'll be able to change the whole nature of the world by stopping the sun in order for us to get rid of our enemies. So therefore, that's why, Yadati Bini, I know what I'm doing, and I know what you don't know. I know the future of who they are, what's in their genes, their greatness. They're both great. Nash is very great but Ephraim is greater than he is. Therefore, I'm giving him the main blessing. 
I know you put them the right way. I know where they are. But I put my right hand on Ephraim because he is the greater one of the two, even though he's not the firstborn. So the question is, so how come? Why did Manasseh, who's the firstborn, lose out to Ephraim? Why was Ephraim greater than Manasseh? If he was the firstborn, so he should have had Yeshua come out from him. Why did Ephraim take over all of a sudden? If Manasseh was the firstborn, he should have Yeshua. And Ephraim should have Gidon. Two great people, but he was greater. Why did it change over from Manasseh to Ephraim? That's something that was, he's saying that's the fact, right? The fact is Ephraim is greater. His, in his genes, we see greater people coming out from him. He's the greater one, therefore he deserves the blessing. But we have the question, that's the fact. Well, why is the fact that way? If Manasseh was born first, he should be the one to get the main blessing. He should be one of the main genes in, his, in, the, in, in, in his, himself. The answer is, Rashi tells us, that Ephraim and Manasseh, both, as we said, were great people, but Ephraim did something that Manasseh did not do. Manasseh did something that Ephraim did not do. Ephraim was the one who stayed by Yaakov Avinu. Yaakov was in Mitzrayim for 17 years. Right? We came to Mitzrayim, came down to Egypt. When Yosef revealed himself, he told him, I'm still alive. Yaakov came down as soon as possible to see him and lived 17 years before he died in Mitzrayim. And during that time, Ephraim was the one who stayed next to Yaakov Avinu and studied Torah from him. He was the one, everything that he studied. Yaakov Avinu was the the great Torah personality, the great Torah knowledgeable person. Remember, he studied Torah 14 years in the Shiva of Shem Ver without sleeping, just putting his head down when he's running away from Esau, besides all the Torah that he learned before that from Yitzchak. And he spent years and years studying Torah, and he gave over that Torah to Ephraim. Ephraim stayed by him to study. And they learned day and night. He studied everything they possibly Of course, he wasn't as great as Yaakov, naturally. He couldn't be as great as Yaakov. But he was very close to him. And he studied all the secrets and the matters of halacha, of Jewish law, of Jewish philosophy, of Jewish life. Everything was to know about Judaism. He stayed and learned Torah from, from Yaakov. Menashe, on the other hand, he stayed with his father, Yosef. Yosef was the second, second to the king in Egypt. And he had to take care of the royal matters. He was the king's palace, very busy. Of course, now that the famine was over with since Yaakov came, but the king appointed him second in command. He was a very busy man, Yosef, even though he studied Torah himself very much. But he couldn't study as much as he'd like to because he was very busy. Like the Rambam himself says, he writes on himself, the Rambam, the great Maimonides, who was, wrote such great, illustrious books, but he complains that the Sultan of Egypt took him to be his doctor. He was a great doctor, the Rambam. And he was very busy. People came to him for medical advice, medical cures. And he says, I can't study Torah like I'd like to, because the whole day people lined up and out of his office the Rambam in Egypt, and they came to him with all kinds of physical problems. The Rambam wrote books on, on, on medicine. As a matter of fact, in the non-Jewish world, the Rambam is known the father of medication. The Rambam is considered the father of, the, uh, of uh, cures through medical, through, through medicines. The Rambam is considered, he had a lot of uh, ideas of different medical uh, uh, advice he gave to people how to take different type of medications, the herbs and so on. People go back to herbs again today. The Talmud talks about taking herbs and so on. The Rambam is considered the father of prescription medicine, he's called. Father, he gave people prescriptions. So he was very anxious to study Torah, and he didn't actually in his younger years. He got older, he, couldn't, he, he was very busy with, with, uh, with taking care of the king and all the, all the people that came to him. Yosef, was the same type of uh, situation. He was the head of the Mitzrayim, second to the king. Very busy 
taking care of the country, economy, and so on. And Menashe was his assistant. Menashe stayed with him, taking care and helping his father run the country. So you had Ephraim studying Torah the whole time with Yaakov, and you had Menashe staying close to Yosef the whole time. Naturally, being close to Yosef, he learned a tremendous amount of Torah also on how to, how to treat, work with people and how to treat people and so on. So they both grew in their, in their own way to be great people and do everything according to Hashem's, God's guidelines, how he's supposed to act. But Ephraim was considered greater because he studied the Torah all those years by Yaakov Avinu. And therefore, he surpassed him. He was born second. And, Yais, Yaakov, and Menashe was the firstborn, but it should have been Menashe getting the main blessing, but he, Ephraim with his diligence and his, uh, his, 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 his uh, great desire, burning desire to study Torah with Yaakov, he wouldn't leave him. He was able to surpass in greatness the Ibn Menashe. So therefore, he was merited to get the main blessing more than Menashe, who was the firstborn. We find that not only by this guy, we find by Esau and Yaakov the same thing. Esau was born first, but Yaakov surpassed him. And we find other places the same way. Even though this person could be a firstborn, and he should get the main blessing and the main uh, 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 the the uh, the main uh, uh, giving from a father to a son, but it's possible for a person to be so great to surpass the firstborn. So that's why Ephraim, Yosef wasn't realizing that that that's going to happen. So he thought that Ephraim <coughs> would be second and Nasha first, and now he found out. Yadati mi yadati. I know what's happening right now. That's the first Yadati. But I do know what you don't know, that Ephraim has the genes of greatness over Manasseh. So that's why he, uh, he gave the main blessing to him. And then he went on with the blessing. He went on to the blessing now that we figured out why he's doing this, why he's putting his right hand on Ephraim, and then he went on to bless the both of them with his right hand the same way, same position, because <coughs> he wanted to put the main blessing on Ephraim. And he said, with, with you, the Jewish people forever, Lasting generations will bless their children and say, God should, how do I translate over here, the last one, the future Jewish people will bless their children by saying the following, God should help you to be, become like Ephraim and Menashe. Imagine that. The Jewish people from now on, from that time on, when they give a blessing to the children. A lot of parents do that Friday night. Maybe I'm sure a lot of you have that tradition. The father, when they come back from the shul Friday night, puts his hands on the children and says, God should make you give the opportunity to be like Ephraim and Menashe. The question is, why Ephraim and Menashe? Ephraim and Menashe were two of the twelve Children, because they were grandchildren of Yaakov, the sons of Yosef. Yosef, like we studied before, merited to have two of his children because he's really the firstborn, because uh, Yaakov served Lovan to get Rachel to be his wife, and he fooled him and gave him Leah instead. But really, Rachel was really the main wife that he had, so therefore we consider Yosef his firstborn. The firstborn gets a double portion. So his double portion of Ephraim Menashe. So he had two sons. So the 12 shvatim, 12 branches of the Jewish people, are, are, are all of them. And, and, and here Yaakov says, God should make you like my friend. The blessing should be, should be like, like a friend Manasseh. Why not the Reuben and the Shimon? Why not Levi and Yehuda? Why should the blessing be that they should, all the Jewish people say, 
you should say to his children, you should be like a friend of Nasha. This we have to understand. Hope next week, well, next week we'll talk about Purim probably next week. Purim. Two weeks from now, we'll uh, discuss why Manasha and Ephraim, more than any other, they're all great. Yehuda, Yehuda was a, came out from the Malchus, came out, royalty from Levi came out, the priesthood, all the great Shvatim, all the great branches, the children, and uh, these two people, Shem should make like them. So we'll hope to discuss that next time. I hope you'll be able to sleep tonight. In case you can't sleep, call me, collect, and I'll tell you the answer. So now we're ready for some questions. Questions in the room? Don't be bashful. Questions in the room? Joe, hold on. Rebbe, I hope I got my, uh, my chronological uh, order correct. We know that Ephraim, we know that Menashim and Ephraim were born in Eretz Mitzrayim. In Egypt. They were born in Eretz Mitzrayim. Yep. I'm right, yeah. We don't know exactly what years, but we know that it was during the seven years of plenty. Right. Then we know that the, the other brothers came after two years of the famine. And we know then Yaakov came to Eretz Mitzrayim. Now, it would seem based on the order in the, in, in the Pasha that it, it says, I think, Yaakov was on an age and he couldn't see properly. So it would appear that he was about to pass on. And we know he lived there seven, approximately 17 years. There's also a Pasuk that says they were sitting on Yosef's knees. So it would seem to me... Uh, Yaakov's knees. Oh, oh, oh Yaakov's yeah, knees, yeah. okay. But it would seem to uh, me... Uh, says, later on, I think it was Yosef's right. knees. Right. And the Pasha. Yeah, the Pasha. Yeah. 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 So they were sitting on... Uh, in either case... Here, I mean, here at his knees, when he took him, Ben Birkov, he took him between his knees right now when he gave him the blessing. Okay. Because Yaakov's knees, but on the, later it says knees of Yosef. Yeah. But if we literally say that they were on someone's knees, they would have been fairly in their later teen, teenage years. So what do you, uh, so my, my question, if they were his, if they were Yosef's They were, sons, they were, Zaka was 17 years in Mitzrayim, right. and they were born, seems in the beginning of, of the nine years. Right. Probably they were about 24, 25, 26, right. when they gave exactly. the blessing. That's my point, so seems to literally, me. If the, literal, if the Torah literally says that they were sitting on someone's knees, it would seem, it wouldn't be, how can you say it? It says, B'nai Mochi ben Menashe. It's B'nai Mochi, the grandchildren were on his knees. Ah, so it was B'nai the grandchildren. B'nai Mochi ben Menashe. B'nai, okay, B'nai Mochi ben Menashe. So there was grandchildren on his knees. Okay, so it wasn't yeah. the, the, the two no, sons. No. But he, between his knees, it says he took them, he kissed them, he hugged them, he took right. Bain Birkov between his knees, he took them, but that's, that's possible, that they're older already. All right, thank you for clearing okay. okay. We have an online question from Eli Kadeh. He wants to know, Purim is coming up. Um, Rabbi Mintz might address this next week, but let's get the scoop. Um, he wants to know why we give Mishloach Manos on Purim. Why we give gifts of food to other people on Purim. Well, that uh, is a very good question. Why we give Mishloach Manos on Purim. And uh, there are many different uh, explanations for that. But uh, one very beautiful explanation is that, of course, it goes into the whole story of Purim and, and the essence of Purim. But uh, we know that Haim Haman's Gezerah was his decree to kill all the Jews. And all the Jews, how did they get rid of that wicked decree of Haman by doing tshuva? Mordechai got the Jewish people to do tshuva, to repent certain uh, sins that they had. And he got them to repent. And we know that when the whole congregation of the Jewish people get together to do a mitzvah, it's much greater than a person by himself doing a mitzvah. The more people together that do a mitzvah, it's a greater mitzvah. Whether it's 
reading the Torah, whether it's putting on tefillin in the morning, whether it's saying tehillim, psalms, praying, whatever we do with the tzibur, it's much greater. There, the whole tzibur, the whole Jewish nation did tshuva. The whole Jewish nation did tshuva. Unbelievable, the tshuva. Lord I got them to do tshuva. So it's such a strong, outstanding tshuva that they did. That's what broke the gzera, broke the decree of Haman, since the Jewish people, I don't know if ever, the Jewish people ever did a tshuva like that in their life, in the whole history of Kali Yisrael, the Jewish people. As a matter of fact, our, our rabbis tell us that uh, Haman did a great, a great favor for the Jewish people. He got the whole Jewish people to do tshuva. Nobody else could do that. All the prophets couldn't get them to all the people to do tshuva. Haman did it with his, <laughs> with his decree. So since it was such an outstanding, overwhelming tshuva of the whole, the whole Jewish nation, so therefore it broke the gezerah. So we want to show appreciation to each other. To show everybody, you know, if I did tshuva by myself, it wouldn't have helped. You did tshuva with, together. That's why my tshuva came better, because you did tshuva to me, with me. Every person says to the other person, because of you, that's why I benefited. The other person says to me, because of you, I benefited. So we want to show our appreciation to everybody. We say Shalach Man is a present to show our appreciation that the Jewish people have to come on to each other. If we want to be strong, we want to be able to accomplish, we want to accomplish if we do it as a, as a tzibur, as a nation together, without machlokas, without people arguing and bad feelings and so on. If we do it as a nation together, we can accomplish so much. And we have to show, show appreciation to each other for the other person, because of you, I'm better off. Because of me, you're better off. Therefore, we get Shalach Manas to show appreciation to everybody. This, for the scholars amongst us, this, the Dera, the Sivas is pure. So that's, that's one of the nice experiences from Shalach Manas. Hi, Rabbi. Um, so I have a question about uh, Shabbos Goy. Like, how does the concept work? Why is hinting uh, better than asking him straight up? And also, just a quick attachment to that question. Um, can I use hands-free voice commands to operate a device on Shabbat? That I can, I can uh, ju just like I ask a Shabbos guy to turn on a light, now I can uh, um, hint the same exact question that I'm, that I'm asking the Shabbos guy, I could just ask my phone and without touching it and it'll operate all my devices, turn on my lights, turn off my lights, well, whatever I need a Shabbos guy to do, that could do. So what's the shtick with the Shabbos guy and does it relate to hands-free devices on Shabbat? Okay, so let me talk first, first of all, there's no such thing that you can tell a Shabbos can do what you want. That's not, so you're not allowed to do that. Uh, first, we have to understand that's sort of a lengthy explanation here. But there's two Isurim prohibitions to have a non-Jew do something for a Jew on Shabbat. Number one, it's called Amir La'akum. You're not allowed to tell a Goy to do a Moloch for you. It's forbidden to tell the Goy to do it. And number two, if he does it for you, you're not allowed to get any pleasure from it. If he does it on his own, you can't, if a Goy will turn on the light, you, you can't use that light. If tell him to put on the light, you can't tell him to put, put on the light. You can't tell him, you can't drive any benefit from him. So that is a mistake people make. Go ahead, not you. It's not true. There are certain uh, ways that it is permitted, but on the, uh, uh, just for the halacha itself, for the law of a non Jew doing for a Jew. Better to tell him is better to derive benefit. From him. And what you said that to uh, have verbal, uh, uh, I guess they called them vibrations, electric, electric vibrations, get commands to you uh, first because you are causing that the light to go on you with your hand, with your mouth. You did it with. Uh, electrical currents, whatever you want to call it scientifically, but you were putting that light on with, uh, uh, it's worse than telling a non-Jew, because non-Jew, he's, not, not, he's not your robot. He's doing it with his own uh, 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 free will to do something for you. 
if you make a machine go by your verbal uh, words, you are causing that to happen, and that's much worse than telling a non-Jew to do it. So even in case, with certain cases where you're allowed to tell a non-Jew to do certain things, somebody is sick, for instance, and uh, all the circumstances still would be possibly forbidden to do it through verbal uh, electrical uh, connections through, through your mouth. As a matter of fact, Ramosha Feinstein says, you're trying to say, do we derive a heter from that? He says the opposite. He says that people want to do malacha with the Shabbos clock and cook with the Shabbos clock and from the Shabbos. And he says, on the contrary, if Chazal would be today, the rabbis who made the decrees against telling a non-Jew to do malacha for us, they would have said, you're not allowed to set a Shabbos clock also because it's not worse than telling a non-Jew to do it for us. If they'd be here today, they'd say, just like you cannot tell a non-Jew, you cannot set a Shabbos clock to do any malacha to put on, uh, to cook and so on, to put on different electrical uh, appliances. So he derives from there for, uh, if things that are forbidden, not to say things that are permitted. Um, if you're on like FaceTime or Skype with someone and they make a bracha, do you get a mitzvah for saying a main? That's a live stream where the person's watching the person on their phone or on their computer, live. You shouldn't answer amen to that. Um, it's a whole question about it because there's a law that if somebody is, uh, says a bracha and there's a uh, idol in the middle between you and that person, you can't answer Ame to their bracha because you're disconnected by. So we have different places of worship which are considered uh, not believing in God and they are between us, between them and the person saying the bracha. And that disconnects us from the bracha that's being said. Probably it's talking to the dibur, it has to be within the. You can't answer Ame if you wait long in the three words, called Shalom Lachi Rabbi. But probably. Uh, if you hear uh, a, a bracha on, in the way that you said, it's probably within those three words. But the question is whether you can answer the question, the answer I mean, but since between the person that said it a thousand miles away and you, there are places which are uh, considered uh, not what we believe in as, as God, other gods that people worship, and that disconnects us from the person. It's, it's a very consideration to that question, question, even though it's not, there might be reasons why it's not like that, but that's a simple way. Uh, so, uh, it says in the Torah that a, person, a man's not supposed to have relations with another man. That's, it, the Torah prohibits the actual act itself. Where do we see from the Torah that the whole lifestyle of homosexuality is something that's not warranted in the eyes of the Torah? We just said now the Torah says you're not allowed to do it. Do the act, but what about the lifestyle that it comes with? What's what? called the lifestyle? We made lifestyle. Uh, 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 if you're not doing the action, then what's the lifestyle? The lifestyle is living a life of promoting all that. What do you see that that's not allowed? You know We'll have to get a. Uh, that the question, Joe. <laughs> Here we hand we'll just mention that cross dressing is also prohibited in the Torah. Uh, let's say I want to visit somebody on Shabbos. <coughs> on Shabbos. You want to what? I want to visit somebody on Shabbos. Visit somebody, yes. And uh, I want to visit them. Let's say he's sick, he's in a hospital. Yes. Now, I know I cannot drive on Shabbos, I have to walk. There's any limits how much you can walk, and uh, can you walk? Yeah, well, uh, you have to be called within the Tchum. You can't walk out of the city. You can walk as much as you want, as long as there's houses along the way. But if you walk out of the city, he looks on a farm someplace, and you're out of the, 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 uh, the uh, Tchum, it's called, out of the uh, border of the city, you can't walk. What about if you want to walk, let's say, five miles to another place instead of an island? If there's housing along the way, it's a big 
open fields for a uh, uh, out, called out of Tchum, then you can't. It depends which part of Staten Island. A certain place you can walk all you want because it houses Highland Boulevard. Highland Boulevard also has, has open spaces. But um, there can't be a, a, a too big of a space between house and the next house. It all has to be houses on the way. Yes. Cannot be open. Okay, thank right. you. How you doing, sir? Uh, I want to know about um, how did the Yidden get to Halas in the Bad Minbo, in, 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 the, in, the, in the desert? How did they get? To Halas. To Halas. So they had everything else. The blue wool. It's the blue wool that was originally used. It was used in the Midbar. It was used in the construction of the Mishkan. It was a blue dyed wool. And it was also used in the tzitzit, in, in making tzitzis. Well, um, there's very many possibilities. Um, they took along, where did they get the gold and the silver and the red wool and, the, and the, all kinds of things that they had. And the wood and cedar trees and so on. So uh, they're all different uh, sources, but uh, number one, they took a lot out of Mitzrayim. Tcheles, when I was in Israel recently, I went into a Tcheles factory where they have the blue wool. That has not been used for many hundreds of years now, Tcheles, the blue wool. We saw the Narcissus is supposed to have some of the blue Tcheles, has been non-existent for many years. Now people now say they came found out what it is, the whole controversy about it. But uh, we saw a whole uh, film on it, and it's called a film today, a video on Tcheles. It's very interesting. I can't go into all the details right now, but Tcheles is taken from what they consider like a snail, which is called a fish. And it's uh, inside of it a certain, uh, maybe you call it blood, that turns blue uh, after certain processes. But uh, Tcheles was a very expensive commodity in the olden days. Only kings would have Tcheles. This blue wool, this dye, and they, blew, they dyed wool with it, or different clothing with it. It was considered very, very precious, very expensive. And they read for us even a proclamation of one of the kings, one of the countries, that says anybody will be caught making tcheles or, or, or uh, uh, transporting tcheles was in danger of losing his field and losing his head. That's what the proclamation said. So it, it was not permitted by royalty for anybody of, of the uh, general public to even to own tcheles or have anything to do with tcheles. It was a very expensive thing. So probably Mitzrayim, they uh, also had tcheles. And we know that when the, Mitzrayim, when the Jews left Egypt, the Mitzrayim gave them all kinds of presents of gold and silver and the copper and everything that took, took, took along with them. And when they went to, to the Kriya Siamsev with the splitting of the Red Sea, the Egyptians adorned their animals with all kinds of gold and silver and so on, and all kinds of begodim, it says, with clothing they took out from Mitzrayim, also with them. So they had tcheles, they had all these things, but from the booty of Mitzrayim that Mitzrayim gave them, they owed them for years of working that made them slave labor all the years. And finally, when they left, they paid them all the wages they owed for hundreds of years. That's number one. Number two, where did they get the uh, cedar trees to build the boards of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle of the Holy Temple and, and the Midbor? Cedar trees don't grow in the desert. So Rashi tells us that Yaakov Avinu, with his prophecy, told the children, when you leave Egypt, you're going to build a tabernacle in the Midbar. Make sure to take with you. He brought down from the land of Israel seedlings of cedar trees, which he planted in Egypt, and told the children, take it out with you when you leave Egypt. When you leave, and take, you'll need that to build the Mishkan. So that's how they got the cedar trees. But the gold and silver they got from the Egyptians, all these riches, and the gems that they had to put in the breastplate of the Kohen God, the high priest had to put in the 12 stones of precious uh, stones. They, simp well, it's a whole question how they got those, but simple uh, understanding that took that from the Egyptians. They gave them everything to get, just get out of here. They gave them the precious things. They got out, they were afraid they're, afraid they're, afraid they're, afraid they're all gonna die. After the firstborn died in the time, the 10th plague, the firstborn died, 
magicians threw them out of Egypt. Get out of here. Take what you want. Keep taking the gold, silver, all the gems. Just leave. Leave us alone. Yes. A question online. How do I know what my specific purpose is in this world? Some people have certain talents that make it pretty clear, but how I don't have any specific talents that I know of. How do I know what I'm here to do? Well, the way we answer that is the main way to know is a person has to have a mentor, somebody that knows them well, somebody that they discuss their life with, somebody that they are open to discuss their uh, aspirations and the weaknesses and the strengths, and uh, a Torah person who has the guidance of the Torah behind them, and people who want to know what their purpose in life is, if they have the right kind of uh, hadracha, the right kind of person to mentor them and explain to them and show them and, and discuss with them and uh, advise them, that's what the person should have. It's hard for the person himself to know his strengths and weaknesses. The person could know to a certain extent, but it's good to have an objective opinion from the outside of who we are, what we're capable of, and get the right advice where we should put our strengths in to develop our uh, hidden strengths or open strengths. Somebody objective to give us the right advice how we should conduct ourselves in our life to use our life to the best advantages and the best uh, way that uh, God wants us to live. A mentor, that's the bottom line. That's a, one word, and one word. A mentor is somebody to advise us according to Torah ideas and philosophy. Schwartz, Yisrael Schwartz from Delhi Schwartz. wants to know if Tchelis refers to the dye or the dyed wool. The word Tchelis itself, it means? Yeah, yeah. Tchelis means a dyed wool. Agoma Tchelis, Agoma means dyed wool. Well, the blue, the blue uh, wool that's dyed, well, the. the uh, it's taken from the chalazon. It's called the uh, the fish of the snail. It comes close to the chalazon. Uh, if you take the dye itself, it's called chelus. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Maybe, maybe it's called chelus. The dye itself before you dye the the uh, clothing with it, it's called chelus. Uh, I can't I can't answer that. I don't know. Usually, when the Torah is talking about, it, it's talking about dyed wool. That's what we're talking about. The, uh, the dye itself before you put it into the wool. Is it called trellis? Can it see? How about any other questions? Uh, yes. Uh, since someone brought up an interesting question, and it, it is a question, so some people don't know it. Whether what you can activate an electrode by activating your voice, and it's quite obvious you can't, you know? Right. One of the questions I wanted to ask is, uh, I know there's issues about cameras, security cameras around shuls. It depends how someone perceives it, you know, someone looks at it to be, you know? Some of those cameras are running by motion detectors. Some of those cameras are running 24, seven hours a day. And basically, what is the real truth about cameras around shuls? Not that I'm an expert, I don't know, but, you know, uh, since they are, you know, you know, activated or they are, fully activated 24 seven, what is the real, what is the real answers about well, security uh, cameras I, around I, shoes? I'll tell you as much as I know about it, which is not uh, a real scientific, uh, but a simple understanding of it. There are two kinds of those cameras. Some are permitted and some are not permitted. The ones you find in the shuls, obviously the rabbi of the shul made sure that it's the type that's permitted. The difference is some of them are going 24 hours, and by walking in front of it, you're not doing anything to activate anything more than was before. Some of them work in a way that by walking in front of it, you activate some elect electric or currents that are there now, that were not there before, and those types are forbidden. So uh, they had by the Kosel, as a matter of fact, the whole controversy guy, the Kosel, the Kotel in Israel, where people go all the time in Shabbat, and they have those cameras over there, you know, they have protection, you know, they're watching over, besides the soldiers being there, they have no cameras all over the place, and there was a big controversy about it. 
but the rabbis were uh, permitted it. Obviously, the type that they put in the type that you're allowed to have. But uh, if if a person wants to uh, do the right thing, we have to find out what type it is in order to know if it's permitted or not, because it is two types that they have. What is the significance of the of the story of of Mordechai, and he heard the he heard the two guards talking, and he and he and because of that he he ended up getting saved later. Why does that have anything to do with the Megillah? Well. It has to do with the fact that all the facts in the Megillah lead up to the miracle. And we want, want to show us that some things that seem insignificant, uh, God makes them happen in order for something significant to come out of it. So we shouldn't look at anything as insignificant. Whatever happens in our life, we might not realize at the time why it's happening, but it might take a year later or 10 years later or 50 years later some significance of what happened a long time ago. So it's showing us that Mordechai, who understood the language they didn't realize, telling us that he, uh, he understood and overheard them, that was God's master plan in order for the great thing to come out afterwards. That was, it seems like a person looking at the Megillah might, well, it was just, uh, it just happened to be, he happened to hear them. It happened to Lester, and everything happened to, happened to happen to be. And they can deny the whole story as God making it happen. But if you look at the whole story from beginning to end, we know that God's watching over us and making everything happen. And he wants us to know that everything that's going on, he's making it, it's leading up to what he wants the, the world to come to be. So uh, not only in Purim did all things happen to lead up to the final miracle that happened, but the whole history of the world in the future is also master planned. Everything that's happening will, in, the, in the future, we'll be able to go back and see the 6,000 years since creation, why everything happened to every person and, and to Jewish people in general, to everybody in particular, it all is for a reason. So that's part of it. God wants to show us that you think that he heard, overheard them and told Esther, happened just, uh, what's the difference? It made a big difference to realize, to realize that we have to know that whatever happens in their life, there's a purpose to it. And there'll be a, if we, if we won't realize it, realize it in this world, we'll realize it in the future why everything happened. But there's nothing happens for nothing. It's always with the, with the cheshman. God knows why he's doing it. Was there one animal that Hashem created with the multicolored skin for the, I think, the tachash? Yes. Was there only one of those? One animal? Yeah, did Hashem only make one no. of them? Because I think that's what I learned, but... As I also learned, Hashem usually made... It was the Chashim, it says Chashim. Oh, so Rabbim says a lot of them. It says Chashim, it says uh, plural. So there's more than one. Okay, so what happened to the rest? They, they came extinct used? as far as, you know, maybe there might be some place in the deep uh, uh, forest someplace, maybe it will come when Mashiach comes to find it, but they became extinct as far as we know. Okay, thank you. Like a lot of animals, when animals came extinct, there were a lot of them around, but they, they're not anymore. Last question, online question. What, one afterwards? One afterwards, okay, we got one afterwards. Is there anything, is there a problem with participating in a woman's prayer service, in a normal woman's prayer service? A woman or a man? A woman, a woman. Not if you're a woman. What's an almost person, what is that? Like a woman's minion. When the shul to make a minion, something like I that? I guess so. You mean they say Kaddish and they say the whole thing? You mean what? Well, I think uh, I mean, maybe, if the women maybe explore want, it. If the women want to daven, this, well, what's wrong with they can daven? They can pray together. They can't say Kaddish or they can't say, uh, read from the Torah. Certainly they can't do. If they're doing the wrong thing, you're not supposed to participate. If they're doing the right thing, they're women praying. It's very nice for women praying. Why not? So they should certainly participate. If they, but they have to ask the rabbi, the Orthodox rabbi, what things they should be doing, what things they shouldn't be doing. But if they're doing the right thing, it's a very nice thing to do, to pray. Uh, last question. If somebody uh, gets on my nerves and, I, and I, I'm on mad at nerves, him. your nerves, nobody on your nerves. <laughs> no. Come on. You can. No. You're, so, you're so patient. You're so passionate. So, so if some, if somebody, somebody bothers someone else and oh. you want to unload and tell a friend of yours, are, is that considered Loshan Hara or are you allowed to do that? Well, the Chavetz Chaim has a little hago on the bottom, Fent, Fent. and he says that uh, if something, uh, 
is really bothering you a lot, and you got to get it off your chest because King Solomon says, if you have a worry in your heart, all the psychologists say today, you know, you got to get it off your chest, otherwise you're going to suffer from it physically, emotionally. Sometimes you have to get something off your chest to tell somebody, otherwise you're just bursting. So Chavetz Chaim says, since we have a general rule that gossip is forbidden, but if it's a purpose for it, so uh, you're allowed to say, if, if, and we always mention, we've studied the laws of gossiping. If you want to find out about, you want to go into partnership with some business with somebody else, and you want to find out if he's honest or not, you're allowed to find out about him. That's not called gossip, which is forbidden. It's not called gossip. You have to find if a person's an honest person or not, so you're allowed to ask around them, but even though they might say bad things about him, but that's permitted. <coughs> so Chavaz Chaim said, that this is called, it's considered, which is necessary for your health to get off your chest. If you're really bothering you a lot and you, and you feel you got to get off your about it in order to uh, calm down your nerves. But not just, you know, you can't use this as a, <laughs> oh, everything, every guy's too nervous, so therefore I got to gossip all the time to calm my nerves. And you have to be really objective about it. I really feel that it's a that it's going to, uh, uh, consider. It's like a, like a medication for yourself to speak about somebody. But if it's the extent that we're talking about, that would be permitted to do so. It's one person, not going to tell the whole world about it. Just one person, get off your chest. Okay, next week is our pre-Purim class with um, Rabbi Mitz will be addressing Purim issues and we'll be wearing funny hats. We'll be having our funny hat contest. We encourage everybody to come to the Ura Purim Suda. Gala Purim celebration in Lakewood. Please sign up at ura.org forward slash events. And don't forget to bring your funny hats next week, next Tuesday night.